This is Chapter 20, Vehicle Extrication and Special Rescue. So when we look at this picture, first thing you see is, wow, that looks like bunker coats and firefighter helmets and gauntlets for the gloves, and I agree. So it looks like it's people who are specially trained in vehicle extrication through their fire service. So when we talk about in this chapter, we're going to make it apply to, to EMS first response. You're going to find yourself in situations where um, somebody's in a motor vehicle crash and you may not have the tools or you may have some hand tools but not the uh, heavy duty um, um, hydraulic tools um, necessary uh, to extricate somebody. So we're going to talk about making it apply just to EMS. We're also going to talk about water rescue, diving problems um, where people are submerged, um, scuba diving, ice rescue, boy we're really thinking about that this time of the year, right? confined space rescue, farm injuries, and bus collisions. It, through any of these, if you don't feel comfortable, if you say, and I, and I hope you do, um, I don't feel comfortable, I don't feel like I have the necessary training, I don't have the necessary resources, then your role is to stage there at the scene and call people who do. Um, so if you are involved in any kind of, rec uh, of extrication, you have to make sure that you have fully protective equipment, similar to the firefighter's outfit. So a bunker coat, if possible, bunker pants, definitely boots, and you should have those all the time. They should be um, ankle support. You should have ankle support with it. Um, toe support, so it doesn't always have to be a steel toe. Um, I love the graphite uh, because it's almost as good as a steel toe and shank and the sole of the boot. Uh, think about it if you step on a nail or something. If you don't have that shank, that nail goes right through the sole of the boot into your foot. Uh, so those those that should be available with you all the time. Helmet with a face shield and then some gloves. Not your PPE, personal protective equipment that you um, use as a barrier against somebody else's fluids, but you know non-penetrable um, gloves, firefighter gloves. So know the limitations of your own training, your own equipment, and your skill level. Uh, biggest role that you have is to identify hazards. And the only way that you can control those hazards is to communicate those very early on in the scene size up. Hey, we have an auto versus a utility pole, and it appears that the wire is snapped up here, and I'm guessing it's still hot. Uh, we have electricity running through it, so we need to get the power cut off. We need to get the pole stabilized. I'm not able to do any of that, so you stage. Uh, gain access to the patients. Uh, and that may be something that you kind of burrow through to get access to a patient once the vehicle is stabilized. Provide patient care and stabilization and only move patients if absolutely necessary prior to the vehicle being cut away. So as an EMR, you have two primary extrication goals, to obtain safe access to the patient and to ensure patient stabilization. They didn't say anything about moving the car, right? So step one, overview the scene. As soon as dispatch tells you, Begin thinking about what am I going to need for this call. Do we need other agencies responding? Law enforcement, fire rescue, you know, how many vehicles are involved? What type of vehicles are they involved? You have a two-car or two-vehicle accident and you get there and one of them's, you know, a, a charter bus or a school bus and it's full. That makes a big difference from just two vehicles. Are there trapped people? Maybe there's... Uh, one of the vehicles is already on fire. Are there hazardous materials in one of the vehicle? So as you approach the scene, before you exit your vehicle, you want to look through that windshield and get an overview of the entire incident. So look at the number, if it's a car crash, look at the number of, ve of um, vehicles. Look if there's people standing outside, get an estimated number of patients. Uh, locate any hazards. You know, it may be... Uh, just that it's really hot. It may be that it's really cold and icy. You know, the roads get slick sometimes, and that's what causes um, uh, the cars to run off the road, and then you step out and you step onto ice. So before you exit that vehicle, you should be able to call for any additional uh, resources. So we look at this, and we see the vehicle on its side, definitely not stabilized. And uh, right there in the middle, I can see a placard in that vehicle. So a placard is always going to tell you that that's hazardous materials in there and you have to be real careful how you approach it. So a uh, van was involved, vehicles on its side, you got a number of responders there and they're already in the cleanup phase. I see the sand there. But it's things that you have to identify um, very early on. 
Step two is stabilization of the scene and of any hazards. So all throughout this, we have to think about there's sharp glass, there's metal. I don't have any cuts on me now, but I could by the time this is all over. So we have to think about protecting, protecting yourself against infectious diseases. We have to think about stopping traffic. And you'll be surprised how many people get in their cars to go see a wreck uh, when they hear it's there. So you've got all the you know rubberneckers going through what, looking at the accident. And if you park your vehicle far away from it, even across the street, they may be looking over at the overturned vehicle and not straight ahead. And that's when you get hit. So park your vehicle so it protects the scene. It warns oncoming traffic. Uh, if somebody else is already doing that, like law enforcement, then park beyond the scene and where you can, uh, but on the same side of the road where you can access that patient easily. Wear an approved safety vest. For the most part, we wear dark colors in EMS. So an, a five-point breakaway reflective vest that people can see you day or night. You're more visible that way. Um, set any, uh, you know, it says ignite fuses or warning flares as soon as possible. You want to go back about, uh, if it's on the highway, at least a mile to set up some kind of warning device and then a, a mile the other direction to let people know, hey, slow down, there's something going on. But, you know, these rural roads and you turn a corner and there's a wreck, there may not be time for somebody to stop. Always look for other hazards. Keep bystanders away from the crash. Sometimes you can get them involved. Hey, I need you to drive down there about a mile and put this, this cone and this sign up you got them involved in this or you can use have a law enforcement set up barrier tape to establish kind of an off limit area okay this this line splits it um, spill gasoline look for any fluids coming out of the vehicle um, very early on and then look at your bystanders make sure nobody's lighting up a cigarette or anything that's going to ignite that uh, so if a fuel if you see a fuel spill definitely call fire department if they're not already alerted for um, you know, rescue and extrication there. And then if the patient are, is in the vehicle with a fuel, fuel spill and the fire department has not arrived yet, consider, um, you know, consider covering the fuel with dirt to make sure that it doesn't continue to, to flow downhill and uh, maybe ignite. And then look at your patients. Maybe it's safer to get them out um, quickly, do a rapid extrication and get them out if you're able to. Uh, rather than leaving them in the car with, with fuel that's all over the place. Um, the You'll be surprised how many times you have to get on scene and the vehicle is still on, the engine is still running, and the car is still in drive. It's not going anywhere because it's crashed. So very early on you need to look inside the vehicle and see if, that, if the car is in park, if the ignition is off, two big pieces of information, and then if you can, set the parking brake. Uh, just because it's everything's off and the car now is in park doesn't mean that it you know may not roll. Uh, so think about that very early. It's uh, don't attempt to disconnect the batteries unless you've been trained to do so. Fire will get there if um, they pop that hood of the vehicle. Sometimes if if there's a fire uh, by opening that hood, it gives it more oxygen as an accelerant for the fire. So keeping that hood down um, very early on is good. Um, the airbags can still deploy after the uh, batteries have been disconnected. So an undeployed airbag, you know, is something that could still go off. Hybrid vehicle and electric vehicles tend to have large quantities of battery, and they tend to be under the, the second seat, under the rear seat. So um, there's specialized training in how to deal with hybrid vehicles. Look all around you for electrical wires you know there could be partially downed electrical wires and the wire does not have to hit ground uh, to arc to you we're 60 percent water electricity loves water uh, to be able to arc to you and get to ground and that's what it's for uh, so kind of look for those never come in contact with them stay away keep other people away um, if a person is inside the vehicle and they have a wire electrical wire across their vehicle Make sure they stay inside the car. The rubber wheels, the rubber tires are going to protect them until they step out of the vehicle and then they connect that metal in the vehicle to ground and they'll be electrocuted. Uh, so instruct them to stay inside the car. 
Always assume a vehicle is unstable. Even if it's four wheels on the ground, there's still going to be some motion as you climb in. As, as people start moving the vehicle, you'll see it kind of rock a little bit. Um, so we like to chalk all of the, the vehicles, and it's just wooden blocks, usually fire rescue carries, that you can put up under the body um, of the vehicle themselves and then flatten the, the wheels. You flatten the tires, and the the body of the vehicle will just sit right on those chocks. Um, so deflate the tire by cutting the valve stem, not the tire. The valve stems cost four or five dollars. Those are easy to replace, but the tires cost a lot more. So for whatever reason, if you have to cut a tire to stabilize a vehicle, cut the valve stem uh, rather than the tire. So it shows um, chalking the, the wheels. Uh, you can also chalk up under the body of uh, of the car itself and then using a knife just to cut the valve stems to flatten the tires very quickly. Vehicles that are upside down or on their side, uh, if you're the first responder, assume that they're unstable. Uh, so you're not going to be climbing on top of the vehicle, climbing inside the vehicle, or anything like that. Uh, once the vehicle stabilized, the glasses along or in the car have different capabilities. The windshield is temp tempered glass, so it's very sharp, and it's got a layer of film over it. It's very easy. It's very hard to uh, break that windshield and uh, and shatter the whole windshield. So stay away from the windshield as far as breaking glass for access. The side and rear windows, though, are not tempered. So I always think of it as the windshield is is a uh, sharpie glass and the side windows and rear window are chunky glass. So you can break a corner, you take something metal, something sharp, and just tap it in one of the corners of that win window and the whole thing will shatter. And then with your gloved hand, you know, gauntlets, non-penetrable uh, gloves, you can start breaking out that glass. Just be real careful that the chunks are not falling in on the patient. Um, the primary hazard with a vehicle that's upside down is that spilled gasoline, so be very alert for that. Um, impact fires occur when that gas tank ruptures during the crash, so if it's not on fire when you arrive on scene, um, if they have a post-impact fire, it's usually caused for, by an electrical problem. And most of the time that can be prevented just by turning off uh, the ignition. All of your rescue and response vehicles come with a very small canister of a, an ABC uh, fire extinguisher, means it works on everything. Uh, it's a dry chemical, and you'd be surprised, as small as they are, how much um, uh, content it has, number one, and how little of it takes to t put out a fire. Um, so you should always be familiar with, you know, have some training on this, because this is not something you want to learn when there is a fire, it's something you want to know how to use at all times. Um, actions for motor vehicle fires, don't be, a, don't be overly worried about discharging the extinguisher onto the patients unless they have open wounds or anything, you're probably not going to have any co complications from that. It's more important to get the fire out and make that scene safe. Um, have someone else gather fire extinguishers from other vehicles if they're around, if it looks like that's going to be uh, more resources than what you have from the one canister. Um, if it's safe for you to enter, then you need to start removing patients from that scene and make sure everybody stays at least uh, 50 feet away from a vehicle that's on fire further away if it's a vehicle with a very large tank. We have a little thing we say um, as far as accessing patients, try before you pry. So using hand tools or power tools to get into a vehicle uh, is all great, but then somebody walks over and lifts up the door handle and goes, oh, the door was already opened. Or maybe it's just locked. Maybe somebody inside can unlock the vehicle for you, and if not, maybe you can break a window and access just from that. So try before you pry. If you access through the win windows, we talked to you before about the windshield. It's got a laminate through it, and it's going to be very hard to get through. Plus, it's a very um, sharpie glass, whereas the side and rear windows are, are easily breakable, and uh, they are more chunky uh, that you know, can still cut you, but not, not like that uh, windshield can. And this is a spring-loaded uh, punch that should be in your rescue vehicle. Uh, you still need to wear gloves because you're putting a lot of force, and as you 
press that in, it's spring-loaded and it punctures and it just shatters uh, that window completely. Try to break the window that's furthest away from the patient so that you don't have uh, glass flying in on them. Always look for those undeployed airbags. You know, it, it turn off the engine, even if the battery's disconnected, it doesn't matter, those things can, and they come out at 200 miles an hour. Somebody could really get hurt with those, so just be real cautious and look for those. Um, you, you don't gain access to the vehicle until that vehicle is stabilized and that, uh, that you've got proper equipment to do that. Uh, step four, initial emergency care. So when you get access, and it may be the vehicle now is stabilized, there's no known hazards at this point, and you have somebody that can crawl through that back window and have access to the patient. And all you're looking for is monitoring ABCs. Do they need suctioning? Are they breathing? Do they have excessive bleeding that you can control? That's it. And then trying to look for an egress, a way to get that patient out. c spine immobilize them and uh, remove them from that vehicle. Leave the patients in the vehicle unless there's um, something like a fire going on or the patient is in immediate danger, uh, meaning that uh, you, know, you can't clear the airway, they're not breathing adequately, um, their heart is stopped and you've decided this is, this is a patient that's going to need resuscitation, um, then we'll get, we're gonna do a rapid extrication. Otherwise, they're going to stay in the vehicle and the vehicle will be cut away from around the patient. Extrication. Step five, patient disentanglement. So we usually think about removing the patient from the vehicle, but it's not that. We're removing the vehicle from around the patient. So this usually requires tools and specialized equipment. Um, sometimes, uh, oftentimes, that uh, extrication usually takes up to about 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, these are people that have experienced uh, and extra training in this. So we think about, you know, kind of that golden period. You got the call maybe a few minutes after the ad accident happened. You had your response time and now you're on scene and fire rescue has been notified and they're going to set up their equipment. So this is going to really extend what we call that golden hour. The golden hour refers to making every attempt at getting a patient that's critical to definitive care, which is a hospital that has 24-hour surgical capabilities within one hour. Now, if that's not possible, we still need to do everything we can to make it that golden period rather than a golden hour. Uh, their best chance for survival increases if you can get them to a trauma center as soon as possible. Step six, preparation for the patient's removal. So as that disentanglement proceeds, there's things that can be done while you're in the vehicle or whoever is in the vehicle with them, uh, making the extrication so much faster. So that access route uh, may not be always adequate for an extrication route just to get a person kind of to burrow in and now we need to make a, a larger opening uh, to get a packaged patient out. Step seven is patient removal. Once that patient is packaged and we say that they're on a backboard, they're uh, belted on there, you know, so they don't have vertical uh, movement nor side to side movement. Their head is immobilized with a collar and blocks. And then uh, we need to make sure that we have access to get them out. So just a little review, call for extrication help when you see that you're going to need it. Specify the types of vehicles involved. Um, and then at least the responders that are coming can be thinking about um, some of the equipment, maybe specialized equipment that they're going to need to bring too. We're not going to stand idle uh, just waiting for help. You know, you're going to look around, identify some hazards, contain your scene, park your vehicle in an appropriate space. You know, now you don't want to be right up next to the vehicle because other rescuers are coming in. You want to think about, you know, my stretcher is ready. When the patient comes out, I've got the board on here, everything, and uh, we, can, we can access them through this part. And, uh, you know, maybe now I'm 20 feet away from the crash site rather than right up next to it. So kind of clear that, that working area. And, you know, like I said in the very beginning, this is a lot of common sense. So, um, you know, use your head. Don't walk into uh, an area that's between a rescue vehicle and the vehicle involved in the accident. Try opening the doors first. You know, sometimes it's just that easy. Look and see, oh, this is locked. How do I get this door open? Uh, can, you know, you know, the patient 
if they're awake, can they unlock the doors? And then uh, once you access them, then you can start your, your um, patient assessment as well as patient treatment. Above all, remain calm through this. Water rescue. So we have a little saying that uh, you know we're gonna we're, first we're gonna reach for somebody, then we're gonna throw something that floats, and then we may tow them in, and before we go to them. So um, we're always gonna try to do something that keeps us out of the water, unless we're a trained uh, lifeguard, you know, or water rescue uh, person. So. Um, try to get like a branch or a rope or something like that that's long enough to reach them and pull them in. If you're someplace that there's a flotation device, you know, it could be the nice little pool rings or uh, something like that that really can sail, um, just make sure it, it floats and you'd be surprised how many things float. If you ever find yourself in water and you're, you know, nobody's coming to your rescue and you have pants on, especially blue jeans, you can take off those pants and tie at the ankle, tie a knot in each of the legs, and then, you know, scoop air and lay over what would be the crotch with the um, legs of that pants up under your arms, and that'll keep you float for about 10 minutes. Then you refill the air, you refill the air. So anything that's floatable, and you can make things that, that uh, are floatable um, to do. Um, you throw something out there to them, um, maybe even a rope that you can pull them in. Uh, like a throw bag. Um, if you had a boat, small boat or canoe, you could row out to them and then get closer to them and throw something. You don't want to have them start pulling on your boat. They're going to tip you over uh, trying to get into the boat if they're panicking. Make sure you have a PFD, a personal flotation device, on if you go. Last resort, um, you may have to go in the water. And if you do, take a branch or something that you can extend to them and they hang onto the branch and you can swim them back to shore. Only if you're really a strong swimmer. If you go out there and actually grab that person, they're going to fight. I've seen, you know, fathers drown their sons because, you know, that person was drowning and he will use that child to pull him down to get his own head above um, the water and breathe air. So you really have to think about that. And see, here's a step. So first you reach um, if that doesn't work or you're too far away, throw something to them. Um, a throw bag is probably the best thing because then you can actually tow them in. Uh, row them in. Uh, again, this person may panic and try to climb into the boat and capsize both of you. And only then go, if you're not trained, then always have something that they're going to hang on to uh, that you can easily let go if they try to, to come towards you. Um, so initially, somebody that's in the water... Um, especially if they're, you know, drowning and you have to do a water rescue, you know that they're awake, you know that they've got an airway, um, that's, that's really great. It's the ones that you find floating on top of the water or submerged under the water that are unresponsive that are going to be uh, more of your concern. So we're going to think about how did they get in that situation? Did they might maybe dive off a bridge and they have a spinal cord injury? Um, so we need to think about that. If... Um, you're doing a water rescue in the water with somebody who is unresponsive. We can start rescue breathing in the water, but obviously you can't start compressions in the water. So you want to try to move them to shore as, as fast as possible. Stabilizing the head and neck, keep them in line position, you know, remove them from the water, place them on a hard surface, and start um, CPR for somebody who has lost their pulse. Always try to protect that neck. Uh, just kind of assume there's a spinal cord injury anytime that you see somebody unwitnessed um, in the water because that may have may have happened. If somebody is awake and uh, uh, conscious in the water, if they report numbness, numbness or tingling in their arms and legs or they're unable to move any of their extremities or even just their legs, um, that could be a sign of a spinal cord injury. In that case, you want to float the board under them uh, somebody holding on to the head and neck, um, kind of, and the board floats by itself. It will not float with a person on it. Uh, so you just kind of slide it up underneath them and then stabilize them to the board and remove them from the water that way. Uh, recreational divers will use a self-contained underwater breathing apparatus called, and the, the abbreviation for that is SCUBA. And it consists of an air tank, which is just air. It's not oxygen. A regulator, a mouthpiece, and then their mask, and sometimes a snorkel and fins. So um, diving accidents can cause a lot of problems. For the most part, if you, if you respond to 
any body of water and somebody has been scuba diving, they usually have problems with ascent. So on their way up, they come up too fast. And the rule for coming up um, ascending is to come up slower than your bubbles. Uh, when people panic and maybe their mouthpiece comes out and they can't breathe and they shoot up, um, they could have air trapping inside their uh, vessels called an air embolism, or they could even have decompression sickness, which is also called the, the bends. And both are caused by tiny air bubbles that are released in the body. And if they're in the vessels, just like if you're thinking about a bottle of water, air is at the top of the bottle and the fluid is at the bottom. So air will always go to the highest part of the body, which typically is the head. So if you have somebody in a scuba diving um, emergency, one of the best things that you can do is place them on their left side, uh, assuming there's no injuries on the left side, if there are, then on the right side, with the head slightly lower than the rest of the body. That's the best thing you can do. So thinking about that, that bottle of water, air being at the top, now you have the head down lower, you have the heart down lower, and if there is uh, tiny air bubbles, within the body, it's not going to hit those target organs as much. The patient can be transported to a hospital, nearest hospital, and they'll probably need to be transferred to a hospital with hyperbaric um, capabilities. Ice rescue, so no ice is, is truly safe. We think about a pond with ice over it, um, and I know that, you know they have these shows with the truck drivers driving on ice, and it just scares me to think about even walking on it. Uh, but if somebody has fallen through ice, um, as the rescuers go out on the ice, it can break also, and then you have more victims in there. So you kind of follow the same uh, techniques as water rescue. First reach out to them, throw something, row, and only then go. Uh, but uh, you want to use something that will extend your natural reach. So think about um, like a, a rope or something like this. So here they paddled out as far as they can, then they throw a rope and they're, they're bringing that person back in. Especially in, in ice water rescue, so ice freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, so water is, is slightly warmer than that, uh, but not by a whole lot. And when somebody comes out of the water into the air, that wetness will chill the body 200 times more um, than somebody that's dry. So getting them out of those cold and wet clothes fast is, is going to be really um, appropriate here. A motor vehicle that's on ice really represents a risky situation, so this is one that you're not going to want to go out there. Just instruct the occupant to open the door and maybe start sliding towards you, grab that rope or whatever you're towing towards them. If the persons that are on ice or in the water, they're at risk for hypothermia. So once you get them into your care. You want to get them into the warmed vehicle as soon as possible. Strip them of their wet, wet clothes. You know, start warming, warming them up as much as you can. If that patient does not have a pulse, we start CPR. You may not be able to use the AED because um, the AEDs don't work on, on patients that are really cold, less than 93 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, we start CPR because we have a saying that goes, the patient's not dead till they're warm and dead. Uh, so you have to be warmed up and then at a hospital determine if, if they're um, able to survive that or not. Confined spaces are usually structures that are um, all around us. You don't really think about them that much, but like uh, in an in a urban area, you know, with the underground sewer and electricity and all, uh, manholes. Um, so uh, any kind of storage tanks, it could be a... Uh, a uh, septic tank even, old mines, cisterns, wells, um, industrial tanks, farm storage silos. Um, these are all things that are confined um, that somebody could uh, fall into and need to be rescued out of. So there's two, two deadly hazards. Uh, number one, there may be insufficient oxygen uh, or even poisonous gases there. And then there may be a, a danger of collapse. So you have to think about, you know, wearing the appropriate gear to go in there to be able to breathe air um, when there's not sufficient oxygen. And if there's a possibility and any kind of gas is present, then you would have your own breathing uh, apparatus. Um, danger of collapse. So it has to be strictly uh, in, uh, intact before a rescuer is going to crawl in there. Um, so if we had something like this, you know, a hole and a patient's in there, um, 
and you're not trained to do so, you're going to stage, you're going to pull out resources uh, from there, but stage for when they get that patient out instead of trying to crawl in there and take care of that. Farm accidents uh, pose a lot of tra challenges. So if you think like a farm silo and there's grain in there, um, and I mean, the patient's going to keep sinking and sinking and sinking really quick. Um, maybe access points, you may have uh, poor roads to be able to get into there. Uh, maybe some animals and, and some things that you have to kind of negotiate before you get there. Um, manure storage pits um, usually produce a lot of uh, uh, gases rather than oxygen, so that's a problem. Uh, accidents with farm machinery, uh, tractors have a very high center of gravity, so uh, they're made now with a nice rollover, roll bar, so if they do roll over, at least the, the uh, driver is not squashed. Uh, hopefully people know how to operate these, and they don't have kids sitting on the fenders and on the front and, and things like that, uh, but now they could get entrapped, so that could happen. Um, if somebody's shredding, if they've got a shredder behind them or a rake or something that, you know, they could be damaged, they could be injured by the uh, sharp objects or even have uh, uh, body parts um, severed off. So, you know, role as far as an EMR and a uh, responder in these is to provide that initial medical care when that patient gets extricated to you. Uh, there's a number of classes if you're interested in. If you say, in, in my community, I have a, a you know, high probability that this could happen and I want to go to further training, this would be something that you'd want to bring up for continuing education. Um, and crashes that involve buses are con considered multi-casualty unless it's just the operator of the bus, but if they're full, we think of having, you know, numbers of people on a bus. So we're thinking of these charter buses or school buses or, um, you know, transportation buses. Um, same thing for trains, you know. Uh, passenger trains carrying a large number of occupants. So we want to do our scene size up. We want to stage where it's safe for you to be um, and then start calling those additional resources. So, and, and if you look at this, it says, you know, call law enforcement, call fire and EMS resources. Wait, I thought we were EMS. Well, in a community, maybe even a small town, if you have uh, maybe 20 victims in a bus wreck, and some of them are, most of them are minorly injured, some of them are critically injured, and you say, well, we have one or two ambulances, where well, you're only going to be able to transport one or two critical patients in your ambulance. So you need to call neighboring EMS agencies, air transport, um, these uh, AM buses, they're like ambulance buses, will come out of San Antonio, so you have to think about really getting those other resources called early. And then you want to set up an incident command system. If you arrive on scene, just you and your partner, the first thing you're going to do is make sure the scene is safe and start calling for resources. Then you're going to jump in and start triaging. So there's no incident command. As soon as more agencies start showing up, and it's usually um, law enforcement or fire will set up the incident command, one person needs to say, okay, I will be the communicator and this is what we need. Everything goes through that one person. So our role is more setting up um, an, e an ingress for all those agencies to start coming in with other ambulances. Um, should that happen? Should you get like, you know, hey, we got a 20 minute response. We got another vehicle coming here. So if you can, if you can extricate and package those patients and put them into um, categories based on their injuries, based on their triage injuries and their severity of red, yellow, green, and black, and that's what we call the start triage system. Uh, simple triage and rapid transport triage system. And we're going to use those colors. I think it's in our next section. We're going to use those colors because that's a universal, through the National Incident Management System, NIMS, it's a universal way we have of communicating with one another. So no matter what hospital those patients go to, if you say, hey, I have two reds, seven yellows, and 16 greens, they understand. They understand you've classified those those patients based on the severity of those injuries. And that's where that, that uh, start triage system really comes in um, handy. So we'll look at that in the next section and go a little bit further with that. So in your um, um, extrication operations here, you should be able to perform, perform the first four steps of extrication uh, while other rescuers are doing those other steps. So that's where we come in, where we start staging for that. 
and uh, getting all of our stuff ready for when these patients are extricated from a vehicle or rescued from the water or from confined space or what have you. Because the biggest thing you want to do is take those simple steps to help the person but not endanger yourself. In confined space rescue, your primary goal may be just to prevent other people uh, from becoming victims. So if you see somebody doing something not safe, you have to step up and say, you know, I always just say, if you get hurt, it makes me have to go to work. So let's not have you get hurt. Which of the following would not be considered a special rescue situation? A school bus collision? No, it's one of them we talked about. A hiker who is falling through the ice, through thin ice? And that's another one. You can't just go walking out on the ice and go get them. A diver who is discovered uh, unconscious on the surface and he may have an ascent problem or an elderly man with chest pain in the park. And of all of these, that would be the uh, like a routine. And nothing's routine, but as much as we can, a routine call. So the elderly man with chest pain at the park. As an EMR, your primary goal in extrication is to use specialized equipment to access patients. Um, well, it's not our primary goal, is it? Um, and specialized equipment usually requires extra training. Access patients safely and stabilize them. I like that. Reach patients as quickly as possible and administer pain medications. Well, uh, at the EMR level, we won't carry any medications for pain. And lastly, dismantle the vehicle or, or machinery with extrication. So the best answer there was access patients safely and uh, stabilize them. Um, for transport. Once you have access, access to the patient, you should perform an exam, an assessment, rapidly extricate the patient, administer oxygen, immediately begin treating injuries that you see. So as we learned in patient assessment, we have to assess and find injuries uh, before we can treat them. So the best answer there is perform an assessment. Uh, this wraps up our extrication and uh, special challenges on here. And then we'll move into the last chapter on EMS operations.